Hey everyone, welcome to episode seven of the happy hour chat. So today we're really fortunate to have uh, a golf instructor here, a golf coach by the name of Jeff Leishman, who is living here down in Jupiter, Florida and works out of the Dye Preserve. Uh, I'm going to give Jeff the opportunity to tell the listeners a little bit about himself. Before that, I'm going to tell you guys a little about the things he probably won't say. So Jeff is a top 100 instructor by Golf Magazine, and he's been voted by Golf Digest as one of the best teachers in the state of Florida. And this is a distinction he gets continually year in and year out. And he works with a lot of tour players as well as a lot of mini tour players. Currently working with Daniel Berger, Will McKenzie, David Hearn, Vaughn Taylor, Brett Stegmeyer. And again, like I said, a lot of mini tour guys in the area and collegiate players, some Metro tour players. So it is happy hour. Jeff, you, you having a drink right now or what? I have, uh, I, well, there's not alcohol in this, but um, okay. uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is liquid. Awesome. Awesome. I am drinking a Stella here. Okay. Beer aficionados out there. So Jeff, why don't you take a moment, like I was telling you before, I, I, I've been kind of doing the bios a little bit, but I feel like you're a pretty eloquent guy. You're going to articulate it a lot better than I am. <laughs> so why don't you give him a little bit of, uh, about your background, kind of where you're from, basically up to the point to where you are now, but kind of, you know, not, I guess you could say talking too much about the odds and ends of, of your bio per se, but maybe just the bullet points. Sure. Well, I'm Canadian. I'm originally grew up north of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And then I came to Florida in the late 70s to compete, to uh, attempt to play competitive golf for a living. I had worked in the golf industry in Canada for seven years and I had achieved my class A status. So I'd always wanted to um, attempt to play competitively and was kind of naive about what it took at that stage, but it was a very good learning experience. So that brought me to South Florida and then as a result of a few years of playing competitive golf, I transitioned uh, into running a golf course in Jupiter. It was just a coincidence that my wife and I ended up in Jupiter, Florida, and we ran a par three golf course called Jupiter Dunes for 20 some years. And um, that was a, a learning experience on a number of different levels because of the operational standpoint, but also sure. we were running a very big junior golf program and it was in conjunction. At, it was at a similar time to when Mike Adams was running a similar a larger or a large program at PGA national. Right. And we had a really good relationship where uh, I, we would see kids from ages five, six up until about, 13 or 14, and then in a lot of cases, they would transition over to, to PJ National and be, have access to a full-size golf course. And, and, the, and then um, I got into teaching and coaching sort of towards uh, the middle point of that period um, mm -hmm. when I had the opportunity to, to spend more time with better players. Um, Jupiter started to grow as a place where there were more uh, – competitive golfers that were choosing to come here and then past relationships that I had with um, people that I played with myself. And then uh, about seven or eight years ago, I had an opportunity to connect with the Dive Reserve and uh, my wife and I, we stepped away from Jupiter Dunes and now that's where I call my home and we have a wonderful heading facility, heading bay there and I've got a great relationship with that facility. So, you know, I think we may have crossed paths at one point. I played on the Golden Bear Tour, as I think you did, probably around the same time, uh, early 2000s or so. And, you know, in my life, I was kind of faced with that decision when I was going to stop playing, what am I going to do? And I just happened to be in the fitness industry at the time, and to, to a very small extent, but that's kind of where I found out my passion played. What was the decision like for you when you, were, when you realized, you know what, I, I, I don't think I can compete with these guys? Um, what am I going to do? Was there ever like a, I don't know what I'm going to do myself, or was it always like, I know I'm going to go right into coaching? Uh, no, it wasn't really that I was going to go right into coaching, because at that time, we were looking for a legal way to stay in the United States, Right. because um, being a Canadian citizen and doing things properly, it required me to be able to transition into a, a way to be able to stay legally, and I... Uh, I wasn't enjoying myself playing competitive golf, so that was that was the real root of it. I um, it was very stressful for me, and I, as it turns out, I just recognized that I wasn't really wired for the idea of um, 
having it all on the line as far as that was concerned. Yeah. I was always thinking of a, of a, of a secondary backup plan and that kind of thing. And, and in hindsight, uh, my planning, I probably overdid all that stuff by trying to have this parachute at the end of it rather than being all in. And I'm not saying by answering your question that way that if I had done that, I would have been more successful. I don't, I don't know. I just know that I wasn't really wired for it. And um, a lot of sleepless nights and just, uh, I, I, w I had been generally successful in a lot of things that I've tried in, in school and in other sports to a degree. But then when I went in all in on golf and it didn't work out for me, that was probably the biggest factor was that, um, okay, I recognize that this is not the path that I want to be on. And how I, the, I, we had a, my wife and I, we had some really serious talks about how do we stay in this part of the world? Yeah. The alternative for me to go back to Canada was I knew what that route looked like. I would go back and I would enter back into the club professional environment and probably uh, work towards being a club professional at a major club and, and hopefully, um, but I knew that that would be, like I wasn't just going to step right back into there. You lose status and position in that environment. So, right. um, but as far as the coaching thing and the teaching thing, no, it was, it was more that we got into operating Jupiter Dunes and that was a real adventure for us. That was, right. um, that was a learning experience and we had all of the same decision-making processes of a full-size golf course, except it was an 18 hole part three golf course. Right. Yeah, that, I would imagine that was a pretty big undertaking if you hadn't any, had any experience with something like that. Uh, you probably well, I, had some, I had experience in the, in the club environment, but not really from the full like budgeting managerial right. standpoint. And my wife's incredibly intelligent and uh, we embarked on it together. And uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. It was a great learning experience. And then uh, that then allowed me to start thinking more about what teaching and coaching would look like. And I was always trying to negotiate relationships because the Jupiter Dunes doesn't have a driving range. So I was pretty creative in how, what I was able to do or where, when I was able to do it. Right. And because we used to do it on the golf course. Well, let's get into it a little bit. Um, when I first met you, I guess about three years ago, it was probably about three years ago or so, I was always impressed by the fact that you really embodied what a coach is. And in my experience, when I played golf for a long time, junior golf, collegiate golf, professional golf, I've always known instructors as instructors or teachers. You typically go for an hour lesson. They give you, they take a video of you. They give you an idea of what you're doing. And then they say, okay, try this to get better. Uh, and that's kind of the end of it. You don't really establish the relationship. Now I want to read a, a part of your website, um, an excerpt from your website that I think kind of embodies what, what I'm talking about. So you say, I have coached 15 players to status and success on both the LPGA and PGA tours and countless others on their journey from, I want to be good to I want to see what I can accomplish, to I want to be the best. In every relationship, I first establish how someone learns and why they do what they do. The how may be verbal, visual, hands-on, or a combination of those. The why may be the result of physical limitations or injury, may be mental, or it may be habitual. So understanding the how and why are the building blocks of a successful coaching relationship. And I think that is really good. And I think you, you well, thank you that very well. Um, now, in my experience, what I've always liked about you is that you're not afraid to say, I don't know if you don't know something, but I will find out for you. And I think that's what a good coach does versus like an instructor, a teacher. You're going to build a team around you, that sort of thing, to, to ask people that might know more about a certain topic to ultimately help the player, which is effectively what we're, we're trying to do. So maybe you can explain to the listener a little bit about your process when you first meet with a player, um, what your thought process is, maybe the steps you take towards taking them on as a client, and then the relationship that ultimately gets formed. Like, how is it unique? How is it different? Well, <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, it's, le you might, it's yeah. less unique now. Um, yeah. and, and that's a credit to how the evolution of the, the job and the use of the word, word coach is a lot more common. Right. Uh, it, it is, it is, um, it's a blueprint that I worked on myself with um, thinking about, in some ways, what I wish I had when I played, because I think we all bring our own personal experiences. And uh, using other sports as a model, like tennis or um, even figure skating. My wife was a figure skater when she grew up, and the really? idea that, yeah, yeah, she, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, yeah, she figure skated in Canada. And uh, this this relationship between a coach, like what was it? What was a really a coach? And and um, 
a mentor or somebody that was on traveling on this journey with you. The understanding of that it was going to be more of a longer road rather than the typical model, which you alluded to, which is a one lesson, like a, an hour lesson. Um, so that the the beginnings of that relationship with somebody is uh, just a. I mean, I describe it as an interview, but I'm open with where I tell people that I, I'm interviewing you and I want you to be interviewing me. So I, I'm really, we're trying to figure out whether this is a situation that's going to work. Right. Like, is it, is there um, some of the intangibles? Like, is there this feeling like this is going to be a relationship that is going to have some lasting time? Because I, uh, I do not, and this is one thing that I now have become much more aware of, when I was on the hourly lesson environment, there was this uh, sense of time. Like There was always this rush to try to find something wrong. So we, you're, you right. were describing that formula that, that, it, that I just felt it inside me that if it was an hour or an hour and a half, that there was a, this um, sense of urgency that we had to, I had to, we had to come up with something here to fix quickly and then have a plan and then send someone on their way. And then if uh, there's some follow-up, uh, then that would be a way to lead to maybe another lesson. But I, I just didn't really like that feeling. And I used to drive to work uh, with a, this, a, a set group of lessons that were stacked in the, in the traditional format of um, nine, 10, 11, 12. And I, I just thought, okay, this is, just doesn't feel right to me. It just doesn't feel like I'm, this is a good environment. So then that started me thinking about, uh, okay, how would I, how, how do I um, schedule or plan this differently? But then also, how do I set this up? How do I set, how do I pitch it to somebody? Because um, it, it's not as unique now um, because of a modification, I would say in the last certainly 10 years or even five years where people are more into um, selling uh, a, a plan for improvements and what, what is that going to look like? Because when you when you are when you're pitching it to somebody and and it's coming with a certain cost, you're gonna have to justify that cost, yeah. and you gotta you gotta explain yourself in a way that uh, makes sense to this person. And if they're if they're in the old model of the hourly lesson as you described, then then the pitch has got to be that much more effective. So I've gotten better at the pitch. I think I've gotten better at um, figuring out whether. Um, there's going to be compatibility. And I, this is something that I continue to say often is that I'm not in a rush. Like I'm not, I right. oftentimes meet people and then probably they're not performing as well as they'd like. Cause usually people don't make changes when they're playing really well. Sure. Right. So they're, they're there and they're in a hurry. They, 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 you know, they, they're, they're eager. They, and, and with social media and uh, the ways of being able to see maybe the initial interview process has already happened for them. Like I like this person's style or they've had success. So I like their resume. And so they're, they're pretty eager and I'm usually pumping the brakes. Like I'm, I'm, we're not, we're not I don't want to rush into this. And right. so I, I, my initial meetings usually are a couple of hours, maybe, maybe a little longer. We just sit and we chat and get an idea of what kind of, hopefully they, and I, I want them to come with questions and I ask them a bunch of questions and yeah. I am also very aware that if they already are pretty successful, which is most of my clients now, they, they've played competitive golf at some level to this point that they, I'm inserting, if this was going to work out, I'm inserting my, 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 um, my experiences and my coaching into their already existing plan. So there's, there's already stuff that has happened in their golfing life that they've arrived at this point they'd like it to be better or maybe it's not right. optimal but but the it's i think it's really important to understand that this is not a blank canvas this is this somebody has had all this stuff that has occurred and um a number of other coaches and people from other sports have done a good job of of articulating this for me that we are an accumulation of all of those experiences so even if in our situation, you and I, in our, in, we can ma wave this magic wand and magically make someone ideal, whatever ideal is. They're not going to be a better golfer simply because they haven't had the accumulative experiences on the golf course, hitting golf shots with that movement, with that right. stuff. Right. So 
I hope that I do a good job of explaining that to somebody because depending on their state of mind, they, they feel like they're, you know, broken. Like I'm sick. I like, I'm using a medical analogy. I'm sick and I want to be fixed. Yeah. Well, it's not quite as simple as that. Right. No, of course not. And I think your model works well with the type of players you have. I mean, obviously you, your clientele is more on the professional end. You do have some collegiate, some amateur golfers as well, but it's that commitment. And I think that appeals to a lot of people like this isn't just going to be like you said, just an hour lesson. This is a commitment we're going at. How did you, how did, I guess I could say, how did you get started with such good players? I mean, I'm, I don't know if you started with the average handicapper, like you said, you were doing hourly appointments at some point in your career, you evolved to start working with, tour level golfers. And I'm sure there's probably someone that you, the first person, you know, that sort of thing that you started working with and uh, that maybe did that for you. Yeah, the first person for me was Melinda Daniels Price. She's married to a good friend of mine, Rick Price, who eventually was a client. Yeah. And that was my first uh, high level competitive golfer. She had played college golf at Stanford. She was currently playing on the um, Symmetric Tour at the time. I'm trying to remember whether it was called the Symmetric Tour at the time. I think it was just called the Futures back then. Yep. And um, that was my first, um, somebody who'd already had a lot of experience playing like competitive golf. Yeah. And she was in the middle of a season too. So there was that balance of, uh, I'd like some help, uh, but also like, all right, I'm playing next week. It's not like an off season or we're gonna like sit down and hash out this plan. And I, all of this stuff that I'm explaining has evolved over time. So um, Melinda, that was probably like 16 or 17 years ago. And so in that time period, I have had this type of discussion either with, uh, in an interview process or with clients. And I, I think I've, or I hope I've done a better job of being able to explain it. But at the time, I, I, wasn't sure about that. I wasn't able to pitch the same thing to her at that point. And I was doing regular hourly lessons. That was the formula. Like the formula has been, and in a lot of ways still is, that if you're successful, you fill your, your appointment book. You have yeah. as many lessons as you can, and you reach a certain point in terms of your reputation that you can charge a certain amount for those. And hopefully you get enough follow-up and return business that you're, you, you, earn a living doing that. And I was, it was a complimentary thing to us running the golf course as well as the junior golf camp. So it wasn't, that wasn't my only thing. And I think that's part of also why it, it, it led me or allowed me to be not quite so like, okay, and I, I need sort of like, um, I need to fill it all day, every day in a way to pay my bills or to be able to pay my mortgage. Right. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the ability to be able to do that and, and have that as like, uh, this is the me getting back to my, like my backup plan, like having this levels of uh, income streams coming in. So uh, I was on a regular program. It wasn't that I just started because I, I get asked that question fairly frequently now mm -hmm. where some young teacher yeah. younger than me will say, you know, I want to coach tour players. And, you know, I like, smile and, you know, it's not quite as simple as that. <laughs> right. you know, you're not just, it's also you know, not, that, not as glamorous, right? <laughs> uh, no, it's not as glamorous. And uh, there, there's, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's not at what I think people tend to think it is, where you're standing on driving ranges in beautiful places and to right. in the top tournaments in the world. Um, there still is a, a quite a lot of pressure in that. Like you're, 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 if you're doing your job and you're empathizing with the person, you're connected. You're, you're, you're connected in that situation. And so uh, it, it's been an evolution for me over 17 years, 18 years. Yeah. It's the same in the fitness world. I mean, there's a lot of uh, trainers that'll come up and say, I want to just work with athletes, that sort of thing. And in my mind, I'm like, man, you got to pay your dues. Like you're going to learn a lot more working with the clients that are over 50 and be able to translate that to the clients, you know, to those professional athletes, professional golfers, that sort of thing. Um, but it's just, you know, everyone, it sounds so appealing at, at first. And then you really kind of, kind of do your homework. You got to really, I say, do your time <laughs> before that. Starts. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there's a, there's a way of communicating with higher level golfers. They, they now, um, 
they've heard pitches before and yeah. you're you know they're a little a lot more skeptical um for good reasons they're no less less likely to rush in you know that that's maybe sounds a little contradictory to what i said about someone who's eager about getting going but um it, it's there's less there's less big shifts in people's plans as maybe there might have been 15 years ago right um because they because they had they had either friends or situations themselves that didn't go so well mm-hmm. so they're a little more reluctant to right right just dive right in there i can imagine yeah they're so that throughout the course of their life they've probably had more than 10 different instructors at some point, or most of them at least, uh, have tried out 10 different, and all of a sudden they come to you and you're the 11th or whatever, and it's like, okay, <laughs> there's a stress involved with that. There's some pressure. So let's get to the swing a little bit, because that's probably why a lot of people are listening too. I remember you saying to me a while back that with every swing change comes symptoms or side effects. And so but yeah, I, in my mind, you're basically implying that the change you're going to make, you better make damn sure is the right change. Because if you don't and you stick with it, we're going to have problems down the road. You have a good uh, line on your website which says, good teachers disseminate information. Great coaches gather all the relevant data and determine what is necessary for a player to see results. So what data do you use? What are the determining factors when you're considering making a swing change with a player? Um, And I'm sure there are a lot of variables to that. But I've always known you and... I was thinking about one of my previous interviews, Carrie Brooks, who's a physical therapist, and I've, I've worked with her for a long time, and she has always erred on the side of caution when it comes to getting someone back from an injury. In other words, don't do too much too soon. Let the body heal itself, that sort of thing. And I, and I think of you, too, in that way when, when people are, are approaching you saying, either saying they want a swing change or going to you thinking they're going to get a swing change, that their symptoms are side effects, that you take that very seriously. So, you know, what are those determining factors? Well, performance. Mm-hmm. Um, some of it also is the, the person's opinion. You know, that, that's, pretty, um, that's pretty subjective. It's not, it's, it's, they're, they're going to either sugarcoat it or also potentially magnify their feelings, depending on past performances, especially with competitive golfers. Um, ball flight. Mm-hmm. Uh, distance, so it, that, that's a, certainly a more more and more relevant factor in the world of high level golf. Like, um, yeah, are they producing enough speed? Um, injury is another factor. Like, is it, do they have a do they have a reoccurring injury? Why is that happening? Is it um, is it motion related? Um, I, so you're having a battle every night in your head, aren't you? <laughs> Thinking about all those things. Mm, uh, yeah, I mean, I write stuff down. I, yeah. I, that's part of the reason why the interview process takes a little longer, like yeah. to formulate uh, more, like the word that's used a little more often now is holistic. Like, you, okay, the bigger picture here, like, um, is it as bad as someone really thinks? Is it as good as what they think? Do they... Um, where are the strengths and weaknesses in this person's um, short-term and long-term uh, plan or their development that are, are adversely affecting their ability to reach their goals? And are they, um, are they, are they, on a, are they based on my opinion, like this is where my opinion comes in and then the opinion of the other people that I are, part of um right the people that i trust then um okay is it is is this person on um a good trajectory and i want to be able to be um clear enough and knowledgeable enough and have enough information that i think that we can do all this analysis and say yes they are on this good trajectory nothing has to change at all like someone might be not performing well simply because uh they're in a period of burnout they maybe are like uh, playing too much competitive golf, there's too much stress in their life. They don't have a good balance between, let's say, you're a junior golfer and you're you don't have a good balance between school and um, social life and some of the other sports, and and you're just not performing well because you don't have good balance in those things. But the rest of all those other pieces, I honestly want to believe initially when I start out that they're fine. I don't want to go looking for problems if they don't exist. Right, right. So 
you know, basically the PGA Tour, I'd say in the last 10 years, this, the data that's coming out as with regards to what's important, what equals lower scores has changed. Um, there are some now that can be considered more statistically significant, like what you can do with your driver, especially. Um, has that changed your style of coaching? Has that, have you had to adapt at all to the messages you're, you're giving your players or become more forthright with, with golfers saying like, you need to get longer or these are the steps we're going to take to get you longer. Maybe in the past, you would not have done that. You might've been more conservative accuracy, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, it has changed more when, it, when it's relevant to a bottom line score. And I, I've been reluctant to do that up until recently simply because I didn't want to put outcomes in ahead of process. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in a process-oriented plan that is going to lead to we're going to get these outcomes. Um, uh, I have changed my opinion about that because uh, my business mind has uh, made it much more clear to me that, okay, this is the outcome which is necessary. And in men's golf, that's 20 under. How, to, how do male golfers at some point in their development over four rounds produce 20 under par? And that's, your, that's kind of your new barometer. This is what you need to be able to do. You need to be able to have the tools to be able to do that. Right. Because that is what is continually showing up in the world of the, develop, the road to get to playing golf as a living for, for a career. Hmm. So much like business, if we've got a benchmark and you and I are, are making bagels and we recognize that our benchmark, we need to be able to make uh, $150,000 to break even. Mm. we don't make that we we're, we we can make, make wonderful bagels and have a really good plan and be super enthusiastic about it but if we don't make one hundred fifty thousand dollars, we are not going to be successful um in breaking even and then we need to have another benchmark to be able to pay our bills and maybe expand and all these other things well in golf now especially with the men's game it is it's how do how do you have the tools to be able to produce 20 under and that doesn't mean that a junior golfer needs to think that way, but it needs to be part of the journey eventually if you intend to play high-level college golf and then play golf for a living. Now, if your goals are not to play golf for a living, well, then there's a, that's, it's different. Then it's backing off some of that, but it's still relevant because there are going to be people that you're competing against who are going to be wanting to do that. So even if you want to play successful high-level college golf, but you never intend to want to play um, on the PGA Tour, if you're going to judge yourself against the other people that are on that track, um, the Colin Morikawa's and the Matthew yep. Wolfs and the so on and so on, the crop of them that happened, which is going to be natural. If you're a competitive person because you've chose this sport, you're going to be judging yourself, how come I am not doing as well as these people where they're on that track? Right, right. So keeping on distance then, um, since it's obviously so important, are there any particular ways you can kind of share with us that you like to use or methods you like to use to help improve a player's distance? I guess that could be anything from club fitting. Um, I know you do a lot of data work, with body motion, uh, particular moves, technique changes that you, you think work well. Well, it's very important that someone has a good transition sequence because that's the time that they're going to be gathering They've got the opportunity and they're trying to, to gather speed. Right. So if that sequence isn't good, uh, they're going to be handicapped, not only in terms of how they generate speed, but also uh, potential path problems and then some other, um, some other issues. So I, I've got a number, you and I have worked together on a number of exercises to deal with a better transition sequence. Um, the orange whip is a very simple thing that um, is probably one of the number one training aids on the PGA Tour now. Mostly it's been used as a tempo trainer, but uh, measured in 3D almost universally across the board, it um, improves someone's transition sequence because really? they feel the, yeah. the load of, and bend of that and they produce the movements to be able to make it load around them. Um, and stuff like step changes and the towel drill, which, you know, is quite common with right. the people that I work with. I've done it in Golf Magazine. I did it for some videos. It's, um, was, I tested it in 3D a number of times um, in an effort to have this positive effect on this very small amount of time in a golf swing. This, this magical sort of mystery thing that was really difficult to see 
in with your eyes or even in two-dimensional video when frame rates weren't very good it's only been in the last 10 to 15 years when people are really measuring what's going on there that you're having uh, this uh, data-driven plan that is dealing with a transition and a downswing at two tenths of a second and what are what is someone going to do in the gym what is someone going to do um, in their fields and also when they're doing their swing drills to have a positive effect on that. So if someone's on a 3D motion capture and they have, they're hooked up to all the wires and they have the orange whip and they swing and you look at a before and then an after with the orange whip, the sequence will improve. Yes. And then after they use the orange whip, does that, does that feeling stay? Are they able to recreate that transition better? Not always. Mm -hmm. um, no, like sometimes I've actually had people, there's a, a fair high percentage of people that will say they'll start to feel their own golf shaft doing what the right. orange whip is doing. Now there is, right. there's an argument to be made that there's a kinesthetic carryover from right. swinging the orange whip. And so they have that sensation in their hands, um, which is still a positive in my opinion, but um, that may be also the first time that they're actually feeling the shaft of their golf club flex. Sure. Like properly load, they they see they they have that sense of it of the what shaft people call the deviation, of that the bending of the shaft, um, in transition and. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit. Sometimes it's easier. Like right away, like immediately, they get this light bulb that goes off in their head, and then the pieces fall together. Those people usually were better junior golfers, and then like we're talking about amateurs, just not not high level golfers now, but amateurs. Usually they had a better sequence early on, and then at some point in their life, maybe they lost it, or they maybe got a little too preoccupied with positions, and they they lost that feeling. Those are the people that usually have an immediate aha moment. Mm -hmm. For people with less experience, I think that there's that's not enough. I mean, swinging the orange whip is helpful. There's also some side effects from that. It's heavier, it's longer, so you got to watch for early extension patterns and some of the other things that go at times with the orange whip. But I've I use that training aid quite often, even when I'm uh, talking about a path change. So, like, if someone is a little bit more biased into out, and I say, okay, we want this path to go more left, I'll have them swing the orange whip. And, sw and make the rotational changes that change the path, but to make sure that they're doing it sequentially. Sure, that's really good. And so you had alluded earlier about the towel drill that you do with, with clients. And I think just to give people a little bit of a description of that, and I'll probably explain it wrong, but <laughs> you kind of get a mid-sized towel, somewhere between a hand towel and a beach towel, and you tape one end, tie the other end up kind of in, with a rubber band just to make a kind of a firm end to it to some degree. You take the towel back over your shoulders, let it kind of rest on your shoulders. And then essentially the point is to start that downswing at the lower body, effectively keeping the towel on the shoulders as long as you can to create that feeling of transition, feeling of getting the lower body to whip through. Now, I, I, I correct you there, not as long as you can, just okay. to uh, 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 the segment of um, to about chest height. Okay. Because if you keep it as long as you can, you're not ever going to transfer the energy that you're creating um to the ball right so if it's there on your back and you're just holding it holding it holding it holding it you're never um kicking the energy to the next to the, the next segments segment. of your arm yes so and um there's a pretty famous ben hogan video that you can look up on youtube he's wearing all tan and he's uh he's simulating these swings where he's talking about like this and he's um uh, he describing, you know, starting with the hips and you turn your body. Right. I just had someone recently messaged me and said, you know, do you, do you think that Ben Hogan, like, this is like your towel drill? Well, no, I mean, I, this, I, I use this drill because I talked quite a bit about it with John Sinclair and um, Tyler Farrell. Tyler used a rope. Um, there, there are other people that, have used a towel and, and had this feeling. So I didn't invent this. I just, right. um, I, I oh, no, no, would no. say that we've just done a little bit more testing on it because we actually, that it's difficult to digitize a towel. Like you had right. to, John Sinclair, when he came to did 3D, was simulating where the club head would be um, in space, essentially, when he was putting the three, three dimensional markers on it related to a sensor. Mm -hmm. And then we tested it and, and the timings were a little off because of, um, the, or the graphs themselves are off, but we could see 
that there was enough effect or positive effect in the transition sequence and early downswing sequence that, okay, this is, uh, this is good advice. Right. So I think that's a good example too of kind of how you use your, I know on your website, it says you have an advisory board, uh, other professionals in the industry. Um, John Sinclair is one guy, Tyler Farrell. How do you, you're use on it. Yes. I'm on it. Uh, yes. fitness outlet, <laughs> but, um, those guys have effectively allowed you to be accurate, right? To keep the guesswork out to some degree when you're looking at someone's swing because you use their information for the 3D technology. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. We use a, uh, an AMM system and I don't own one, um, partly on purpose, really, uh, because I feel like I'd be a little bit of a mad scientist with it and wiring people up all the time. And uh, I like the idea that there is continuity in the, um, the calibration of the person. So when John is doing it or Tyler is doing it, and of the two of those, this is to give you an idea of how attention to detail they are. They'll actually, they actually did a, um, like a, I think they did a competition to see like how accurate they could do the joint placement when they were doing the calibration for the 3D capture. Mm -hmm. So I like the objective opinion. I like the idea that they come in and we don't do it. Uh, we do it annually and semi-annually and we get this uh, baseline measurement. And this is um, the MM system is a bit antiquated in terms of the wires. It's still the most accurate in terms of the body um, joint centers and, and position and the idea that you can also hit balls outside or be able to see the ball fly. Because you, there are indoor motion capture facilities at universities that are as accurate, but there are people do not swing the same when they swing indoors or they hit into a net. Swing speeds go down. There's a, a little sense of sort of confinement that occurs. Um, good golfers especially need to see ball flight. Right. They will react differently. So the, having those people come in, those uh, friends, and um, they're, we, and you've been part of this, where uh, right now we have the opportunity to be able to capture, put the measurement graphs up, but also the two-dimensional video, and run them side by side. And it's incredibly helpful to then see with your eyes, the two-dimensional video, what you are used to seeing, and that done in conjunction with the actual 3D measurements. And uh, it is, because you're not gonna substitute your eyes. You're not gonna substitute the camera. The, the two-dimensional camera is still very helpful. It's mm -hmm. just, are these things matching? And what are we missing? And what, it, what is it that, that what is helpful to the other pieces of the puzzle that if we, change this one thing, what is going to have a negative effect potentially on these other things? Right. It's, it's a puzzle. Yes. It is. And then uh, combined with the fact that you want to make sure, I know you, don't want it, the, the client, the player, to really know too much at the same time either, right? Because that can be dangerous. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I, I, I don't, it's not in the interest of, of secrecy or right. hiding things from people. It's just a question of what do you do, how – by opening up the, that person's awareness to that, is this ultimately going to be something that um, aids in learning or is it gonna be harmful? Yeah. So, uh, and that I'm, I, I will honestly admit that I'm probably on the overly cautious side of that because I've worked in the environment where I've seen, fortunately I haven't had too many of them myself, but um, I've seen negative consequences of people where they were, you remember that the information was good. I mean, I, I would listen um, either on driving ranges or even hear a sort of course mortem on what happened. That It wasn't the problem with the information. It was just that that got, that awareness got put in there and that person wasn't used to thinking about it. And in a competitive environment, it had a negative effect on their performance. Right. So, Jeff, you there? Yeah. So the um, getting just kind of staying on the distance thing, uh, force plates are they've been around for a while, but they're becoming more popular in the teaching world. It seems that's all I hear about. And one of my personal questions I wanted to ask you about: What are your thoughts on kind of using the ground more effectively to create speed? Is that something that you're actively engaging your clients or your players with, with regards to trying to get them to hit the ball further? 
um, in particular, using that lead foot, pushing that lead foot down, getting the hip back, creating force back up and through the body. Well, I'm asking uh, you this because I hear it all the time. Okay. <laughs> and I want to know um, your opinion on it. Is. Yeah, before the current state of the golf environment and the uncertainty of um, what was going to happen and me making hopefully sound decisions financially, mm -hmm. I was on the verge of buying force plates for our hitting day. I've um, put a hold on that simply because I didn't want to make the financial commitment at this stage without right. knowing what was going to look like over the next sure. several months. So I had decided and, and I'm deciding to do that because I felt like it reached the point where there were enough people that were in um, smart people, smart coaches yeah. and uh, biomechanists that had enough data to be able to say a little bit more clearly about this is the pattern that we want to see, or this is the pattern that exists enough percentage of the time. Because that is also was the threshold for me when it dealt with 3D. Now, I don't know whether I would describe it the same way, uh, having been through that, but so three-dimensional motion capture came along on the golf stage, I would say, because John Sinclair has been doing it just about as long as anybody. He was one of the first people, I think, and Tyler were one of the first people that also beta tested that system for the golf environment. But motion capture has been around for a while when it comes to um, range of motion for, um, for surgeries and, and joints, um, mm -hmm. but also then what really accelerated motion capture was the video gaming industry. Right. They wanted to have accurate or pretty accurate avatars um, for the video games. So Madden football and Call of Duty and that kind of thing. Um, so the issue with that still was, okay, we're measuring what's going on. Um, we, do we, we need a large enough database to be able to say, this is, there's enough people doing this that we should advise other people to do it. Yeah. So getting back to your question specifically about motion, um, force plates, up until just recently, and I would still say I'm sort of on the fence about how much um, accumulated data, like what are the, what are the, what is the, what are the databases look like for enough good players? Because they were still just, uh, Swing Catalyst was gathering data on um, players at the, uh, at the players' championship. Right. And they were, they were uh, essentially offering like discounts or deals to have people come in there. But mm -hmm. it's so still rel so new that players didn't want to come in. Now, some of that is they don't want to do that the week of the tournament. Okay, yeah. This is a big tournament. They don't want to come in there. But it's still people don't really want to see what's going on. Right. I remember that period with TrackMan. Okay, so TrackMan came out. People didn't want to see the numbers. Don't show me the numbers. You can look at it, but just don't show me what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, that's pretty much past. People yeah. recognize, okay, the accuracy of this, the value of it, TrackMan's not going away, or other radar devices like Foresight and FlightScope are not going away either. So um, with force plates, uh, it still seems like to me that people are armed with a new toy. And they've invested a lot of money in this new toy, and so that uh, a lot of lessons now start with ground reaction forces. So give me a quick kind of overview of what force plate systems are measuring, just for people that might be listening that don't know what we're talking about. Well, they measure the forces and also some of the, the they extrapolate the torques of uh, how the body is interacting with the ground to generate speed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the three main forces that are say, measured by swing catalyst are uh, horizontal, vertical, and lateral. So the lateral one is um, easier for people maybe to visualize. It's, you know, how much are you pressing against the ground to push your body to the left or right? Um, and then uh, the rotational force, right. like how are your feet pushing against the ground to create those um, movements, the rotational, rotational movements up forces. through from the ground yeah. up? And then the, the vertical one is the jump, the timing of the jump push-up. So that's where you... You, part of your question was that, like that, the pushing up off of the, with yeah. the lead leg. And that's, um, uh, that one is effective, especially for better golfers, because um, in the transition sequence, they've generated the speed. 
And then in the timing of that, uh, the rotational and the push against the ground is how they're transferring that speed to their arms, to the club, to the ball. So most people who are high level golfers will gain speed from some feeling there. Um, and you know, some of those ones are uh, related to how they're interacting with the grip, like long drive guys will talk about feeling like they're going to pull the grip off the club. Yeah. Um, that there's enough bracing or breaking of the body, like slowing down. And that's a hard concept for um, a lot of golfers to wrap their head around is that you're not applying speed here down at the ball. Your speed has been gathered over here. You're transferring it by actually slowing these parts down. Right. Your, your legs and your, your thorax, your chest. So um, that brace up move and the, and the subsequent um, backing up of your upper body does actually produce better impact conditions. Yeah. The problem though, is if it's not timed correctly, like if it's not, and then this is where um, the data has caught up enough people are measuring it, that it's um, like Mike Adams gave a presentation that I listened to that was pretty clear um, the end of last year in November, I believe, uh, that said, stated that they had enough information to be able to definitively say now that on high level golfers, the orders of these um, forces are lateral, rotational, vertical, in that order. So you shift laterally, you then add rotational, and then they peak in that order, which is logical to me. Makes sense. Makes sense also with what I have uh, understood or listened to about 3D motion. So that's a point where, okay, there's, a, there's been enough smart people that have gathered this information. They've seen a pattern. They can definitively say at this stage, doesn't mean it doesn't change, but at this stage, this is the order that we see. And then you can start to think about, okay, how am I going to apply this information? So if you're applying this information to someone who doesn't have good sequence and they just start pressing up through their lead leg, that can go really bad. Then they're, then they're all they're gonna do is probably magnify a standing up pattern. They're gonna magnify more early extension. They're going to uh, have a, a whole bunch of negative side effects. Right, right. Yeah, so, I mean, that answers my question to some degree. I think it's important too for the listeners to know that the, the sequence part is extremely important. Just because you're putting pressure into the ground doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get the result you're looking for. It has to happen at the right time what Mike Adams was basically. Yeah, and, and good players in that transition sequence have um, a lowering. Like the, the most famous discussion recently has been about Tiger Woods' lowering. Rory McIlroy lowers. So they're almost all powerful golfers. I would say not almost. I would say probably all powerful golfers. They lower into the – they retain flexion again on the downswing. They lower sink into the ground. It's part of what creates the pressing – the vertical forces down to then be able to push back up again. So if you're a golfer that doesn't do that, and then you push up, right. then you're, you're going to be produce, producing positions that are um, not powerful because you haven't set yourself up for the, the jump, the push right. up. So I've kept you here for a while. You've been very generous with your time. I've got one more question and it's something that I fight with a little bit too in my industry is, uh, if you're trying to change a movement pattern, or in your case, make a golf swing change, what does it take, in your opinion, from your experience, uh, from a motor learning perspective, to actually do that? And that, what I'm asking is with regards to time, repetition, uh, style of practice. Is there anything, or what do you impart upon your players saying, okay, we're going to undertake this. This is what we're going to try to do. You are not used to doing this. This is not part of your normal, comfortable pattern. What, is your, what are your expectations with change in that? And then how would you go ahead to provide that recipe for change? Well, I don't know, or I have not experienced myself, or I have read or heard a definitive timeline for that. Uh, there was a rough kind of thing about a habit in terms of breaking habit or learning habit of 50 repetitions a day for 21 days. Yeah. yeah it's like that one stood for a while. I really don't know how applicable that is in terms of motor learning anymore. Um, I mean, it's a nice sort of phrase to put in perspective. Okay. 21 days, three weeks. Okay. Or a roughly a month. Um, but I believe that people can change faster. Do they own it? I, you know, like I, I think ownership 
is different when it comes to a competitive golfer and being able to use it in a situation where they are completely free and trusting and be able to allow whatever movement is in there to come out. Yeah. That's a, that's a different point. But uh, as far as embarking on that, I think it's very important that you have a really clear understanding of what it is, what, it, what, it, what is the thing and why. What, the why is very important. Also be able to pull it out individually. So if let's say you were going to be working on um, another very common uh, topic these days is arm shallow. Okay, so let's just say someone is a steeper person, they have a steep arm movement, they tend to pull down more on the club and their um, lead arm um, doesn't, doesn't pro, it doesn't supinate or pronate, excuse me, pronate. So they, they do not, they don't, they don't have that shallow remove. So it's very clear that they um, want that. They, this is the reason why, pull that out and then not only be able to identify it, but then put it back into the sequence. Right. And then I think it's important that, that there, there are um, a screen, first of all, to make sure that they're capable of doing it, that right. they work in conjunction with someone like yourself to make sure that there are not exercises that would be negatively affecting that, like mm -hmm. say more vertical chops. So let's just right. say someone's really into this chop pattern. They really like that feeling. They're activating their shoulder in a certain way. Indirectly, it's... Um, it's having an effect on their arm, but it's, it's not really relating to pronation and supination, but it's more in this chop. Well, it's probably not a good idea they do those exercises for a while. So they're going to have to replace that. And because they, if they're just trying to get rid of this lat dominant pull down, all right, we've got to figure out a way to be able to still feel like we're engaging this part of the body properly, but maybe not in this pattern. So I really think it's important that you have this multiple uh, angles of attack, some being more important than others for some people. And then there's also a way to figure out, okay, am I doing this? Like that's maybe where video comes in or there's going to be some sort of follow-up feedback. Like, okay, I feel like I'm doing this and it's improving, but is, is there a way to objectively have someone or some way of being able to determine whether it's actually happening? Or not? Yeah. And I think the high handicap golfer, the amateur golfer that goes out there, that's, that doesn't sound very appealing. At least the reality of it does, doesn't. Um, no, no. Quick fix idea. I left the lesson hitting the ball better. That's what seems appealing. And I think sometimes people fail to realize that if they are actually trying to make a swing change, the amount of repetitions, the amount of time it's going to take. And at the same time, like you said, not including other things that are going to damage that or damage that process. And I yeah. And, and if, anybody, if people are practicing and playing golf on a semi-regular basis, whatever they're doing now is working on some level. Sure. Yeah. It so it's not, it, it's yeah. the blending, the, the, the mass, the pieces have come together in some way that they're seeing some, otherwise they wouldn't have kept doing it. They, yeah. they, they, they're in some way so that, that if they're standing up and flipping the club and they can see now on video, cause the, cause cameras are so great on phones. Well, you know, I don't like this. All right, great. But it is working on some level. So if sure. this gets torn apart and gets rebuilt, you're going to have to put in all this time that even if you don't like this, you put all this time in to make this work on some level. I mean, you could be chunking it. You could be sculling it. You could be, you know, all these yes. things. Oh, yeah. But you've got to be fully committed to that process so that's going to make you a better player. And that's where the, the pressure, on, obviously, falls on your shoulders to some extent. Because um, it's no uh, fun to watch that. No, no. And that, but that's where it gets back to, to uh, how, why I wanted to change my philosophy or why I didn't like the idea of this time. Because I've been in that situation where – You've prescribed something to somebody, all right, this, you know, this is going to be hard, got it, great, you know, they, they don't want to be defeated, and they, they start doing that, and it's maybe 45 minutes into the lesson, and we're going to wrap this thing up in 15 minutes, yeah. and they have not gotten better. They've gotten better in their understanding of what they wanted to do, but their ball control is not better, and so if that's it, they, if they if they leave after the next 15 minutes and hand over some money and go um, on their way, that's not going to be good for them. It's not going to be good for your relationship with them. And it's not going to be good for even the concept that this is going to lead to, there's no light in the end of the tunnel for them. They just got this information, started doing it and the ball control went for crap. And now, now what? Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, like you feel like you have to get that information in and get them hitting better in an hour, but with the with a little different formula, you feel a little bit more comfortable that you've done the right thing as an as a coach. Yeah, and if if I was um, to go back and go to a formula, let's say was hourly lessons, like I, I rewind the clock and current me goes back and says, okay, for the next month, I'm going to teach only hourly lessons. I think what I would be better at is I would be better at set up, setting the stage or the explanation like, okay, you sure? You really, you know, this is probably – you know, just, just basically like prescribing a medicine that's going to come with some side effects, you know, okay, we, I know that this medicine is going to help you, but you know, it's also going to cause these other things. You're going to have to be ready for these side effects. Right, right. So I'll kind of leave with this uh, kind of a fun question, I think, because I think about this too. Uh, I've been, God, I've been in the fitness industry now for about 15 years or so. Um, and I look back sometimes and I, and I think of old clients that I was training in the beginning and I think to myself, what was I talking about? Like, well, really, I gave this person this thing to do. Or, do you ever have moments like that where it's just like, man, I've evolved. Like I am different other than the fact that you've obviously changed your formula with how you're coaching people. Yeah, I think it's okay to see that you've gotten better. Cause if you look at the fundamental nature of us as human beings, we, we get, we learn based on our mistakes. Yeah. Okay? And it's not really great to be able to say, well, you know, these clients that I cut my teeth on, I made mistakes. I, from my perspective, I look back and I think, okay, my intentions were pretty good. I just know that I, I, am I not pretty good. My intentions were good. I, it's just, I lacked the patience to be able to just not talk. <laughs> like, like take some time advise this is what we're going to do and not need to keep saying stuff. Yes. Like, it's a good um, yep. you don't, don't need to keep talking. You know, there's, mm -hmm. you don't, silences don't need to be uncomfortable. Like <laughs> you've, you've given this person this stuff and they're, they're working away on it. They're, there's the perception is that they're struggling, but they're just, and allow them to ask the questions rather than just, I, I wasn't very good at uh, letting that um, play out. I, I, there, was too, there was too much talking. Like I, I felt compelled even when I was dealing with good players early on like to solve the problem, to solve, right. okay, why did that bad one happen? You know, I have, I have in high relationships now with people who hit bad ones. You know, I'm, I'm standing on the driving range with a high-level golfer and they hit bad ones. I just know now that everybody hits bad ones. I've, I've stood on the driving range when Tiger Woods is hitting bad ones. I mean, it's just, it's, it's more, you, you're not in this sense of urgency to fix things. Like, right. you know, this is a complicated, <laughs> there's a bunch of stuff going on here. Don't need to be in a rush to fix this. Yeah, that makes sense, man. I mean, it's the same in the fitness industry. Coaches tend to talk too much when they're cueing clients on how to move and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, Jeff, thanks, man. You've been really insightful as always. And I appreciate your generosity with your time, your opinions, um, and you do great work, man. So I'm an honor to be a well, part of you. Thank you very much. You're, uh, and, uh, you're, you're a big part of my life and I enjoy talking to you, um, both about golf and business and, yeah. and social media and stuff. And so I really value your opinions and, Thumbs um, up to Belinda on the social media. Rocket. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. Well, I love it. This is a big step for you to be doing this. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm very happy to be on this and um, anytime I can help. And I, and I, um, I'm very, I try to be very genuine and true to the fact that the people who are part of, I won't call them a team, but you know, advise me, help me are very valuable. They're indispensable. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that you um, are in as are part of that team. So thank you very much. Well, thanks on my side. I've learned a lot from the whole process. So, uh, so I appreciate your time with this again. I look forward to seeing you in the future and, uh, thanks man. Okay. Take care.